Hi, this is Josh and Tyler from SpectraCal. Thank you for joining today's webinar on how to create a calibration 3D LUT for a supported monitor. In this webinar, we will show you the step-by-step -step process for how easy it is to create a highly accurate 3D LUT for the color correction of your professional or broadcast monitor. There are three ways to apply a corrective 3D LUT. You can apply one in the creative, editing, or finishing software, which we covered in the previous webinar using DaVinci Resolve. If you missed that, you can click the link here. You can load one into the monitor itself, which is what we'll be showing you today, or in an inline 3D LUT box, which we will cover in next month's webinar. All of these webinars are completely free and accessible from your mobile device or desktop computer. If you'd like to attend any of these webinars the day they occur, you can do so by clicking the link here, which will connect you with the registration page. If you have any questions during the presentation, feel free to post them in the comment section of our Google Plus page. You can also use the Twitter hashtag video calibration. Before we dive into the demo, let's go over the calibration software and hardware that we'll be using today to calibrate a 3D LUT. Tyler, can you go over those details? The setup we're using today is the Azo Color Edge CG246 monitor that has built-in 3D LUT support. Software we're using is Calman Ultimate 3D LUT workflow, but you can also use Calman Studio. The meter we're using is the SpectraCal C6 meter, and the patterns are the Azo built-in pattern generator. After we show you how to create a 3D LUT for the Azo, we will show you how to create a 3D LUT for the TV Logic XVM series monitor. The setup we're going to be using for the TV Logic is we're going to be using Calman Ultimate. You can use Calman Studio as well. We're also going to be using SpectraCal C6 meter. We're going to be using Virtual Forge pattern generator software and a Blackmagic mini monitor using its SDI output to the TV Logic monitor. The TV Logic is going to be an XVM 245W. We also have a serial to USB adapter and a null modem serial cable to connect Calman to the XVM itself to its RS-232 port. So now I'm going to open up the Color Cube 3D LUT workflow. Now that the workflow is loaded, I'm going to go to the first page. First thing to do is we're going to find our meter. I'm going to hit Find Meter, hit Search. And we want to make sure we have blue green LED selected. That's the type of backlight technology that the Color Edge monitor has, also known as GB-R. Now we're going to find our source, which is our pattern generator. We're going to select manufacturer Azo, Color Edge monitor USB, hit connect. Once you're connected, the monitor will display a flat gray screen. So you really want to have a separate monitor running Calman when you're doing this process, even if it's just temporary. Now we're going to find our 3D LUT device, which is again, the Azo monitor. We will select Azo as a manufacturer. Now there's two options here. Some of the Azo monitors only have 1D LUTs. The model we're calibrating today has a 3D LUT. So you got to make sure you select Color Edge Monitor 3D LUT as the model and hit connect. Don't be alarmed if the screen is flashing and showing weird things while we're connecting. It's completely normal. We will go to next and we will set our targets. There's a couple of different ways you can set up one of these monitors. If you're using it as a video device fed from something like an AJA or Blackmagic device, you would want to keep Calman in video mode, 16 to 235. If you're using this as a UI monitor for a computer, then you want to switch this to PC levels or full levels, which is the way we have it set up today. Now, since we are setting this up as a UI monitor, the standard for computers is sRGB. So instead of using BT1886, we're going to use sRGB as our color gamut and our gamma profile. Once we have our calibration standards selected, we will go to next. Now we are on our pre-calibration page where we're going to measure what the native response of the monitor is with no LUT applied. 
Now remember, this might be pretty bad because essentially there's no correction happening and we're just seeing what the native response of the panel is. So all the other presets in the monitor, like the sRGB and Rec 709 ones, all those have their own 3D LUTs that are being applied. When we do our pre-calibration capture here, there will be no LUT applied and we're just measuring the native response. So don't be alarmed if it's really outside and not close. We will hit our read series button. This part is gonna take just a minute or two, so we'll come back once it's complete. Now that our pre-calibration capture is complete, we'll go to the next page. Now we're gonna see some red or green dots that are telling us if, if our display needs to be calibrated more before we apply the LUT. This particular display does not have any controls besides a backlight control when you're creating a 3D LUT. So even though the white Delta E is higher than you would normally want, we have no way of correcting that. So the only correction that this monitor has is applying the 3D LUT. As long as your luminance is set correct and ours is right at 100 nits, so that's fine, we can proceed to actually creating the LUT. We will hit the Calibrate LUT button. This page applies only if you have a 1D LUT in your display. Now this display is capable of doing a 1D LUT, but you can only do a 1D LUT or a 3D LUT. You can't combine them to do both. So we skip this page if we're creating a 3D LUT for this device. If you connected to it as a 1D LUT device, then you would do just this page and not the next page. Now we're going to create our 3D LUT. We will hit the AutoCal button, which will bring up the AutoCal dialog. The ASO monitors are very linear and almost always work great with the lightning LUT, which is what we're gonna be doing today. I'm gonna to select lightning LUT as a calibration type. We wanna make sure that this is full range because we're using this as a UI monitor for a computer after this. And now we will hit the OK button, which will start the LUT creation process. This process will take about five minutes so we'll go ahead and come back when it's all completed building the 3D LUT and show you the results. It looks like our lightning LUT just finished and now we can go to the next page to view the results. So now we're gonna run a read series. And this is gonna take just a few dozen readings, a color point, so we'll come back in a minute or two when all the data is collected. Now that the measurements are complete, you can see we have very low Delta E's. In fact, they're so low that they're almost not even showing up on our Delta E 2000 chart. We have an average of 0.2 and a color checker Delta E average of 0.5 and the grayscale is the same, 0.2 and 0.5. Most color scientists would say anything below one is imperceptible to human vision. So this is an excellent calibration. Since CalMan has direct integration with the Azo Color Edge monitors, and their 3D LUTs or 1D LUTs. After we created the LUT, it was automatically loaded into the monitor. Some monitors, example being the Flanders Scientific monitors, need to manually load the LUT using a separate cable. So CalMan would just write the LUT file to our LUT folder, and then you would take that file and move it over to your monitor. Now we're gonna show you how to calibrate the internal 3D LUT of the TV Logic XVM 245W grade one broadcast monitor. We're gonna be using the color cube workflow, the SpectraCal C6 meter, and SpectraCal's virtual forge pattern generator. I have the workflow open, color cube 3D LUT, and I already have my meter connected. My meter's already connected, but I need to select the RGB LED mode for the meter, because this is an RGB LED backlit display. We're gonna search for our source, which is virtual forge, we're gonna select SpectraCal as the manufacturer, Virtual Forge. Your machine should automatically come up here, but if it doesn't hit search, I'm gonna select it, hit connect. Since this is an LCD display, I'm gonna use full screen patterns. We're gonna to go to find 3D LUT device, select TV logic, and select your COM port that your serial adapter is connected to, in this case, COM4 hit connect. This does take a little while because it's over serial. Don't be alarmed if it seems like it's taking a little while. 
now that we're connected, our LUT memory, we're going to select user. And we have the same one already selected in the display itself. Once you click it, it will take a few moments to switch to that LUT memory. Okay, now that we have selected the user 3D LUT memory, we're going to go to next and select our calibration standard. We're going to use video levels or SMPTE levels. We're going to use BTA 286 as our EOTF or gamma and HD Rec 709 and D65 as our white point and color space. Now we'll do the pre-calibration measurement to see where it is. This really doesn't apply. We're not going to see what it was out of the factory because once you're in that user LUT mode, it's essentially in a native gamut mode. It's not applying any LUT. So if you wanted to see what your monitor was really doing before you created the LUT, you would select one of the presets and measure this, and then you could switch to the user LUT to see what it's doing in its native mode. Before I take the pre-calibration measurements, I'm going to ensure that our pattern delay is correct by running the pattern delay optimizer. Click the center tab, which is our pattern generator, and go down to our optimize button and run the optimize procedure. It's all automated. It essentially makes sure that when Calman goes to take a read, the pattern is fully rendered on the screen. There is some latency in the system, and we never know quite what that latency is unless we actually measure it. And you also don't want it to be too long and have too much delay, or else you're just wasting time, especially when you're making a 3D LUT. It adds a lot of time when you're taking several thousand readings. Now we will run our pre-calibration capture. This part is going to take just a minute or two, so we'll come back once it's complete. Now we're going to go to our display performance analysis. Normally, you would want to make all these green. On this display, when you create a 3D LUT for it, it goes into its native mode, which is applying nothing. No correction, no white balance controls or anything like that. It just is what it is, and then all the calibration happens with the 3D LUT. As noted in our quick start guide, you can't do the RGB gains and offsets in this display if you're going to do a 3D LUT. Because of the way that they're in the video path, they'll actually make the LUT not work properly. So you want to leave those as a preset, like 6500 or one of those. You don't want to modify those controls, put it into a custom mode or anything like that. Since we can't actually optimize the display, we're just going to go to the calibrate cube LUT part. And since this display does not have a 1D LUT, we can skip over this step. Now we're at the Calibrate Cube LUT page. Since this is a grade one display that will probably be used for color grading, we're gonna run an IRP LUT just to make sure it gets that extra little bit of accuracy. We'll go to our AutoCal. I'm gonna switch this to IR Profile, point-based, I'm gonna do 2000. Now I've already ran the Pattern Delay Optimizer and that's where the pattern delay optimizer, if you don't run it, you, you won't get an accurate estimate of how long the actual calibration is going to take. So you want to make sure you do that. And now I hit OK and let it run. Now we're going to let Calman do its thing, and we'll be back after we create the LUT. Now that our 3D LUT is complete, it's loading it into the TV logic now, and it does have this thing where it wants you to power cycle the, the monitor, which is essentially turn it on and turn it off on the front panel button, not the like big switch at the back. And then after it's back on, hit the OK button. And now it will be complete. Go to Next and run our verification. So now we're going to do a read series here. One thing to note that we didn't show is on the TV Logic monitor, it can take between 8 and 12 minutes to load the LUT because it's doing it over serial. So don't be alarmed if it, if it takes a long time. And this is going to take just a few dozen readings of color points. So we'll come back in a minute or two when all the data is collected. Now that our measurements are complete, we have a grayscale delta E average of 1.1 and a color checker delta E average of 0.6. If you want to calibrate a different color space besides Rec. 709, the TV Logic, each of its color space settings, not only the user one, but it, like it's Rec. 709 or DCI P3, you can write over those with your own LUTs. If you wanted to, you can make the Rec. 709 preset, Rec. 709, and the DCI one, write your own DCI P3 LUT over the top. 
you're not just limited to the user LUT. You can write over the built-in color spaces. Those are their own 3D LUTs. Thanks, Tyler, for showing us how to create 3D LUTs for an AZO and TV Logic monitor. Calman supports many display manufacturers. Here are just a few of the displays we work with that support 3D LUTs. Expect many more to follow throughout the rest of the year. The next webinar, which will be on calibrating a client viewing display with an inline 3D LUT box, will be on July 16th. This will be beneficial to anyone that has a client viewing monitor or HDTV or UHD display that has somewhat limited calibration controls that needs additional fine tuning. If you have any questions, please jot them into the comment section on our Google Plus page or using the Twitter hashtag video calibration. Now let's get into the live Q&A. All right, so question one, is there a way to use resolve patterns to do the calibration for an AZO CG223W and not the monitor's internal patterns? That's a good question. Tyler, what are your thoughts on this? Um, that particular AZO has SDI, and if you're going to be using it as an SDI monitor, then you'd probably want to use external patterns that are SDI-based, just to be sure. Um, you can use Resolve. I, I, on that monitor, if you're using the HDMI input, I would, I would not use Blackmagic's HDMI output for that. But with that particular monitor, it does have SDI, so you should have no problem using Resolve as a pattern generator, and it would probably be a good way to go since it's an actual SDI patterns. That was a really good question because I feel like there's so many ways you can generate patterns into displays. Um, when people are always just looking for the best best generator to use for their particular case. So yeah, just to kind of reiterate, in this case, um, use the uh, internal patterns and it's recommended over the resolve. The next one is how can uh, how can I be able to upload into the monitor the above resulting LUT and subsequent modified LUTs for other color spaces in the future without the need to rerun the calibration process? Um, it sounds like what he's asking is our using our retargeting feature, where essentially when you create a, a LUT with Cowman, we save a profile file, a CPFX file, and that that file holds all the measurement data, every single measured read. And since we use that, all that data to generate the first LUT that you made, we can just go back at a later date and use that same measurement data to create a different LUT, um, whether it be a different format or a different color space or gamma or white point. Um, so yeah, you would just you just want to make sure you don't get rid of that profile file. Um, it's stored in the Calman LUT folder. And usually what I do is after I make a LUT, I'll go in there and rename that um, the monitor's name and the date and stuff so I know exactly what that profile is for so I don't get confused at a later date. I'm really glad somebody asked this question actually because uh, we recently shot a video showing the step-by-step -step process of using the retargeting LUT feature. If you go to our YouTube channel, you can actually find this. It should be pretty recent. I think it's the second or third video on, on our video list. So uh, check it out, watch the video. If you have any questions, just feel free to comment right there on the YouTube video or send us an email. Okay, so the next question we have here is, my pattern generator only outputs HDMI. Can I use HDMI to SDI converter to calibrate a broadcast OLED monitor? Um, with converters, it's really easy to go from SDI to HDMI, which is the opposite of what, what this uh, person is asking. Um, we've tested a lot of uh, HDMI to SDI converters and only a few of them have worked properly. And it, the, the only way you would know is if you have uh, an expensive scope or a, a actual pixel value picker. So unless you can verify that it's not doing any, the most common thing they would do is compress the range from 
from ha having super white levels compressed down to SMPTE levels, but it's it's essentially then the bit levels are wrong during the calibration. So unless you can actually verify um, that the levels are correct of your converter, I would suggest to use a native SDI pattern generator, um, whether it be like something like the Fuji IS Mini or Virtual Forge with a Blackmagic or AJA SDI device. All right, so it sounds like best practices are, um, when in doubt, try not to use a converter unless you absolutely have to. And if you do, you feel free just to reach out to us and ask us just because we have experience with almost all of these devices. Another one that came in, and this is a this is a something I've heard a lot, is is anyone making a 3D LUT box that supports 4K? Um, yeah, that I mean that's a solid question. I've I've heard that one a few times as well. Um, as of right now, nobody is currently shipping a 3D LUT box that supports 4K resolution. Uh, however, we did see a couple demonstrations at the NEB show a few months ago. Um, one was at the Ruiz booth, which is a partner of ours. They had a 3D LUT box and it was doing 4K in and out. And um, they, they had two versions. One was an HDMI 2.0 version and one was just SDI in and out. Um, and yeah, so as soon as we get these units in-house and start doing testing um, and integration support, we'll start giving you know different uh, feedback and opinion on these. But uh, as of right now, there is no shipping 4K a lot box. What some people have been doing, it, it's kind of a kludgy and expensive situation, whereas if they're using a quad SDI signal for, for 4K or UHD, they'll actually use four HD LUT boxes <laughs> and put the same LUT in each of them. But obviously that's expensive and it's a lot of, <laughs> a lot of stuff just to get it done, but it's kind of a workaround that's been happening around Hollywood right now. Cool, that's a good idea. The next one is, can Calman calibrate a prosumer Sony 4K projector to DCI P3? Yeah, so um, you, with Calman, as many of you know, and some of you may not know, you can actually calibrate any display or projector that has calibration settings. So measuring the display and adjusting uh, the controls to move towards the standard. If the Sony 4K projector has a color space that's close to DCI-P3, then the answer is yes, you can calibrate it to DCI-P3. We would recommend you simply go into Calman, make sure that the standard is appropriately adjusted to DCI-P3, and then go ahead and do a pre-calibration set of measurements to make sure the projector is on the right user mode, which is you know hitting close to that particular spec. If the mode it's in isn't close to DCI-P3, then go through and measure all the other user modes to see if there's one that's close. Um, if you don't find any that aren't close, then the projector can't hit DCI. If you do find one that's close, leave it on that user mode and continue the calibration process. One, uh, one comment about that is, it's really hard to make a device that hits P3 and Rec 709 100% because of the the green of P3 is so far at, over to the right edge of the spectral locus that it's hard to make a projector with a primary that hits P3 and will cover full of Rec 709. That's why a lot of uh, displays will only claim like 98% of DCI P3. They can't get 100% of the green primary of P3. So be aware of that. But if you did do a 3D LUT, then we would calibrate everything that the monitor could do inside of P3 and you would just not get that fully saturated green of P3. Um, this is, here's another one. Uh, Josh, does Calman need to run on a separate computer or can it be run on the Edit Bay workstation? Yeah. Um, we have this question a lot. You can run Calman on either machine. Obviously, if you're running it on a, a single edit bay and you're you're in a facility that has multiple edit bays and maybe different monitors throughout the facility, maybe a good idea to actually put it on a laptop 
um, our recommendation is a MacBook Pro with a Thunderbolt port and more than you know eight gigs of memory. Uh, the benefit of this is that now you have a portable kit with your meter and your T-tap or whatever um, hardware device you're using to output the patterns with Virtual Forge. You can run around, you can calibrate all the GUI monitors in your facility. You can calibrate all the uh, traditional or client viewing monitors with the built-in controls manually. And then you can also build 3D LUTs for all your grading displays and like we were showing you here today. So um, it will work in both cases, but we see most people setting it up on a portable system. That was a good one. Uh, here's another one that just came in. How do I tell which meter mode on my i1 display pro to use with my panasonic lh2550 broadcast monitor so this is a an issue that comes up a lot where manufacturers aren't that forthcoming on what their backlight technology is so i have a couple of rule of thumbs that i use to figure it out if it's an lcd monitor and they never mention LED anywhere in the marketing, then it's definitely a CCFL. Because if it was an LED, they would use that for marketing purposes. Now, when you're talking about different types of, of, of LEDs, it's a little bit more complicated. Usually, if a display can only hit Rec. 709 or R sRGB, it has white LED backlights. If it can do P3 or Adobe RGB um, and it's LED backlit, then it's most likely an RGB LED or blue-green LED. Um, cause you really can't hit like really, really wide color gamuts with white LED. And if, if you ever can't figure it out, uh, just give us an email support at spectracal.com and we're pretty good about figuring that out and helping you come to which meter mode is, is the correct one. Here's a question that I often hear, which is we are thinking about buying a consumer 4k TV to use as a client monitor in our color grading suite. Do we need to use 4K patterns when we calibrate it? Almost pretty much every single 4K TV I've measured, there was absolutely zero difference in, in color performance when it was being fed uh, 4K or 1080p. The only reason that you'd want a 4K pattern is if you were you know, doing like a resolution testing or making sure that there's no high frequency roll off or some type of one to one pixel, making sure it's one to one pixels. That was the only reason that you would need to use 4K patterns. Um, so, like I said, almost every single one I've ever measured, it measured exactly the same when I sent it 4K patterns or uh, 1080p patterns. All right. So, here's something we sort of take for granted around here just because we're so used to all the measurement devices. But what is the difference between a colorimeter and a spectroradiometer? A colorimeter essentially has red, green, and blue filters that mimic um, the 1931 color matching function, how our eyes see. And the way they work is they need to know what the spectral response, like how much energy is in the red, green, and blue areas of the spectrum that the display has to properly measure it. So that's why colorimeters have profiles for like OLED or white LED or CCFL. They need to know what the what the backlight spectrum or uh, light spectrum that it's receiving is to properly measure. Where a spectroradiometer doesn't use any of those. It it usually uses a diffraction grading, which which is kind of like a prism, but it's uh, for ref it's reflectant and usually what happens is it reflects off this it gets spread up it gets spread out into its component colors and then there's like a cmos or ccd strip of sensors and each one of those sensors corresponds to a certain wavelength and that's why like higher end spectros have like one nanometer steps stuff like the i1 pro have 10 nanometer steps so they actually measure the light and they don't really care what the what the display type is um, but the thing about that is, is they're not very sensitive to low light and they can take, it can take a long time for them to take a reading, but they are inherently more accurate. So that's why a lot of people will, will pair a higher end spectro and a colorimeter and create a three by three matrix, 
uh, profile, and that will essentially transform the readings of one to the other. So your your faster and better at low light colorimeter reads the same as your spectroradiometer. You've already touched on some of the points for this next follow-up question, but I'll ask it just in case there's anything we maybe missed. And that is, what are the strengths and weaknesses of each, and why would you use one over the other? The strengths, the strengths of the spectroradiometer is it doesn't depend on, it doesn't depend on profiles or anything to read. Uh, it can read any type of backlight, any display. You can even measure sunlight with it or light from a light bulb to see what its spectrum and its color temperature is. Whereas the colorimeter, it needs to know what the display type or light source is. Um, spectroradiometers are slower. They're not um, as accurate in low, very, very low light. Um, they need to, some of them will need to take like a 30 second reading when you're talking about near black readings. Colorimeters are uh, dependent on display profiles. And if it's like a new display type that is not in your meter as a display profile, then you would need to create one with the spectroradiometer to be accurate. Uh, they're very good at low light. They're very fast. And um, they're usually, a reference spectro usually costs more than a reference colorimeter. So there is uh, the cost factor. But like I said, a lot of people will have a colorimeter and a reference spectro and pair them up and you have like the best of both worlds. Yeah, and that's a really good point to mention here that when building a 3D LUT, we don't recommend using a spectroradiometer. Um, I mean, you could, but really you're just going to multiply the time it takes to create the LUT. And like Tyler mentioned, when it starts getting into those lower uh, black level readings, it just has a harder time um, differentiating those levels without doing huge long 30 second readings. So it really is best to use a colorimeter. Um, even if you've got a really high end reference spectro, use a spectro profile to display, um, use our, our meter profile utility inside CalMan, and then use the colorimeter to actually build the 3D LUT. And um, a lot of people will, after that happens, they can run like the color checker with the spectroradiometer just to be sure um, that the, there was nothing wrong with the profile and just to double check at the end to make sure of their performance. Uh, looks like we have another question. If I want to calibrate 150 workstation computer monitors, do I need 150 Calman RGB licenses plus 150 Client 3 licenses? Yeah, so this is more of a product question. Um, if you've got a room full of 150 computers, you only need 150 client licenses and one copy of Calman RGB. So what you would do is you'd set it up one computer, the laptop, that's running Kalman RGB, you connect the meter to the USB port, you would install or deploy the client three to all the workstations, and then you would just go from station to station, connecting to each client on each computer. You would calibrate either the single monitor or both the monitors with just the one client license on that computer, and then you move on to the next, and you keep doing that until you've done all 150. So the answer is you only need one Kalman RGB, and 150 client three licenses in that scenario. I think we're just about running out of time here. Uh, so if you have any questions afterwards, feel free to continue sending them in. You can also uh, post to the Twitter hashtag video calibration. You can email support at SpectraCal, or you can also post any comments to Google+. Thank you so much for watching, and we look forward to uh, presenting to you in our next webinar. And we'll talk to you soon. Thanks so much.